The muffled sound of rummaging could be heard coming out of the speakers, as frantic voices talked over each other, rushing to try and put together the sequence of the events. But who could it even have been? Rapri exclaimed. I don't know, Desil replied nervously. It was your room, sir. Don't you have any idea? Calm down, a third voice interjected. Warrant Officer C. Heiferty, as Shida now knew. I'm checking back with the security footage. We'll have them found out in no time. But what could they even have wanted? Desil chimed in once more. What did they know about the target? Footsteps could be heard somewhere close to the microphone, but out of sight of the camera. That will all remain to be seen, Rabrigue answered, keeping himself surprisingly collected, despite his situation. In fact, he seemed to be getting lost in thought, although he still appeared irritated, as he turned his gaze to an out of sight corner of the room and asked, Also, oh, what are you even doing there? As if on cue, suddenly the video feed turned a lot brighter, as objects hiding the device and blocking out some of the room's light got pushed aside, and a high, energetic voice gleefully called out, Found it! Suddenly, the feed turned blurry, as the camera was presumably pulled out of his hiding place and lifted into the air. Even when it was held steady once more, it needed a second to adjust its focus and settings to the new position, and lighting it now found itself in. Say hi and smile for the camera! You're on TV! The same gleeful voice commanded, as his owner pointed the device right at Reprigan to Seal, who looked back at it in barely restrained shock. Apparently, this Sky Girl was having quite a bit of fun with her situation. Might as well look the part! After a second of bafflement, Reprieve shook his head, apparently shaking off his surprise, and intently walked towards Sky, reaching for the device and loudly ordering, Give me that! And with that, Shida leaned back away from the screen, and let her eyes wander upwards towards the station ceiling. Behind her, she could hear Noah's whispering being exchanged between Moore, Pippa, and presumably Quiss, although she, of course, couldn't hear the Anidala sigh. Meanwhile, Curie sat near motionless next to her in front of the screen, and kept modestly observing the transmission from their spine device. It was hard to say if this was a problem. It could very well be. If the warrant officer was really checking back with the hotel security feed, it would be easy to track all of this back to James. However, it would be hard to prove she had anything to do with it, even if everyone would probably assume that from the start. Then again, could those people even make accusations against them, if that also meant exposing themselves? She felt a hint of nervousness creeping up within her, Somewhere, suppressed deep down. It was strange, really. She had expected to completely lose it should they ever be busted like this. Even the thought of it had made her nervous, but now that it actually happened, it somehow didn't feel like that big of a deal. Maybe it was the inevitability of it that calmed her down, or maybe it was something else. She was pulled back to reality when things behind her were getting louder. Just what did they want that child to give Miss James off that would be worth paying her such an amount? More ruminated out loud and she got in so much motion while talking that Sheila could hear her fur rustle. What influence could that girl even have on him? I don't know, but all of this seems extremely strange to me, Pippa replied to her, sounding suspicious even in her voice. Makes you wonder what kind of guests were around during that meeting. Well, at least they were taking things seriously now. Took them long enough. Well, no need to wonder. We can just ask James once he comes back. Sheila injected herself into the conversation, slightly turning her head to look at the giant woman talking behind her. He should be here any minute now. There was a lot they needed to ask him, and there was probably even more he wanted to tell them now. He'd been gone for quite a while, after all. A quick look forward informed her that Reprieve and Consorts had apparently managed to deactivate Curious Device somehow. The screen had turned black, apart from a white rotating symbol in its middle and a line of writing that Sheila couldn't read. Although she had to guess, it probably spelled something like Connection Lost. She looked over at Curie, who was still staring at the screen, as if there was still something to observe there. She tried to read anything on their face, but it was unflinching and rigid as always. Sorry about the device, she finally said to them, with her best guess being that their invention being lost could be something that would upset them. Don't worry about that, Curie replied, exceedingly casually, and lifted their red eyes away from the screen, looking back at her. It was designed for this purpose. I didn't expect to get it back, it's just sad that it didn't get to be used a little longer. Sheeda shrugged. Well, at least it wasn't the device that got us busted, she stated, reaching over to close the computer. It probably wouldn't be needed anymore for the moment, but it still seemed to capture Curie's attention to an unhealthy degree. I have been thinking about it. With a bit more time, a mobile device might have been a more ideal solution for surveillance, being able to reposition itself to not only more stealthily find cover, but also cover a wider area, Curie mused, probably more to themselves than to Shida. The way they dealt with failure was honestly remarkable, 
always looking for ways they themselves could have improved the situation, even if the failure was in no part caused by them. Good idea, she had commented softly, and turned around, leaning back and supporting herself with her hands on the table's plate. Although, I doubt you'll get to use it any time soon. Being sneaky could be out of the picture now. Possibly, Kira concurred. But we must still focus on improvement. It is possible that a situation similar to this one may occur someday, and if that happens, we should be able to handle it better than we did now. Sheila smirked at that. When you're right, you're right, she said, looking over at the still rattled rest of their group. She tried to sympathise with them. Based on what they had told her, most of them had a pretty simple life, so it was probably their first time getting caught in the act. In fact, it was probably their first time doing something they could get caught doing. After her years on the ship, living a rather uneventful life herself, she could almost imagine what that must be like. Almost. But even after many years on the ship, she was quick to return to her old feelings now that she had been thrown back into a situation similar to her childhood. You can get the girl out of the streets and all that. This also made her wonder how James would react. So far, things had mostly gone his way, after all. She didn't have to wait long for her answer, because only a short while later, Wright has more exclaimed, in any case, this is simply outrageous, an exhausted yet strangely content voice answered. What is? Quickly, Sheila's ears turned in the direction of the voice, her eyes following only fractions of a second later. It had been a long day, and James certainly looked the part. He had taken off his uniform jacket and carried it carelessly flung over his shoulder, while the shirt he had worn under it showed signs of the sweat that had accumulated in the station's warm air over the day, although most of it had apparently dried in the time since he had shed the upper layer. The typical dark bags under his eyes that had slightly receded in the past few days were back in full force. His black hair was messy, and shimmered in the artificial light of the station while it stood up in places. It also looked like the hair on his face had grown longer since she last saw him, although that may have been her imagination. He looked at Moore with a quizzical look, waiting for his questions to be answered, while she'd have pushed herself off the table walking towards him. As she wrapped one arm around him and pushed herself as high as her toes would let her to press her forehead against his, he softly chuckled and pulled her closer, slightly bending down to make things easy on her. It also felt like he may have squished her a bit tighter than he normally did. He was even the first to let out the chuff they used to greet each other this time. Quite the day you must have had, she said, when he finally let go of her and she pulled back into her normal standing position. James laughed breathlessly. You don't know the half of it, he replied absently stroking through his hair with one hand as he smiled back at her. Then he turned over to greet everyone else with an enthusiastic wave while he asked, But seriously, what is so outrageous? It took at least an hour, rife with explanations, questions and discussion, before everyone was caught up to speed. During this time, not only did they fill James in about being discovered, he was also able to fill in some of the gaps for them, so that everything formed a more complete picture. It was surprising, if not concerning, just how high this all seemed to go, However, James remained noticeably unconcerned, which was enough to somewhat calm most of their agitated friends, who had taken the revelation that the guest they had heard about during their observation was most likely a councilman pretty hard. To Shida, a lot of this still didn't make much sense, but she was able to pick out why James was so calm. Whoever they were, or whatever their goal was, they apparently wanted James on their side for it, at least for now. I am really sorry about this, if only we had been more careful. Moore lamented, leaving her big head hanging. James had his hand on his chin, looking down at the bit of usable footage the camera had gathered on his computer screen. No use crying over spilt milk, he murmured thoughtfully, as he replayed the shot of Sky pointing the camera directly at Reprieve and to Seal for what must have been the third time. She couldn't help but snort as she heard that. What kind of expression was that? That, however, earned her a dark look from both Moore and Pippa. Find that funny, do you? Pippa asked her sternly to which she could only shake her head. Well, it's not like we didn't expect you to possibly mess up, she said snidely, and lifted one hand, dismissing Pippa's accusation. Pippa's eyes opened wide, and she turned from Sheeta to James with an impulled expression. You did what? She exclaimed aghast. James let out a long breath, shook his head, and tore his eyes away from the screen. Any of us could have messed up, Pippa, not just you three, he said conciliatorily, looking at her with a reserved smile. In fact, I'm getting the feeling that our dear Reprieve was already starting to suspect that something like this was going on. You mean him asking about your observational, or I guess non-observational abilities? She'd interjected, and leaned over to him, trying to see what he'd been looking for in that video. Yeah, James answered, rubbing his tired eyes with two fingers. He may be an idiot, but he's not dumb. Sooner or later, he would have connected the dots. He stopped the rubbing and opened his eyes again, looking up at Shida. 
Did you ever manage to find out any more about him, by the way? He asked, and leaned back against the table, his back turned to the computer. Right, but I have to disappoint you, there wasn't a lot to find. The only thing I can tell you is that he came on board not long before you. She quickly summarized a whole bunch of boring data from the specs of personnel files she had access to. It is also strange that he never used his actual rank while he was on board. Everything just says Officer Reprieve. James made a sound somewhere between a laugh and a cough. Well, I guess we have a fairly good idea who might have arranged that now, he said, and shook his head with his eyes closed. Right. An oddity for sure, but certainly something that just fit into the pattern by now. She just shrugged and just kind of let herself fall to the side, her head colliding with James's shoulder. She just let it rest there. And what do we do now? Pippa inserted herself back into the conversation, cautiously leaning in a bit closer to the two of them. James took a look over at Sheeta, but she didn't have anything important to say, so he just sighed. Good question, he said dryly, and shrugged with only the shoulder that Sheeta was not currently resting on. What do you guys think we should do? Big eyes looked back at him. Us? More reluctantly asked, turning her head completely sideways to look at James dead on. Sure, James replied with a nod. As I see it, the cat is most likely out of the bag. Everything else will be decided by who makes the next move, or if nobody makes one. And honestly, I don't know if we should act first or not, so what do you think? Moore and Pippa exchanged a few looks with each other. James not having a plan seemed to make them insecure. However, Sheeta could feel James turn to the side, as his shoulder slightly slipped away from under her head. Lifting her head, she leaned around him to see what had caused him to turn. From the looks of it, Quiss had tucked in his arm from on top of the table, while trying to get his attention. Should we just talk to them about it? They signed, their cold eyes looking at James intently. Now that it is out in the open, maybe it would be better for everyone to just be direct. That should be the fastest way to resolve this situation. James nodded thoughtfully. You may be right there, he answered. But I wonder if they see it the same way after going through so much effort to keep things hidden. It would be easier to tell if we wait and see if they approach us now. However, that would also give them precious time to plan something entirely new should they have no intention of coming clean. Listening to that, Quiz tilted their big head, and their gaze seemingly drifted off into nothing for a moment. But that means if we're coming to them, that they won't have time to prepare anything else. That's good, isn't it? Pippa asked energetically immediately jumping onto that seemingly golden opportunity. True, but that also forces them to act, Sheeta explained, extending her open palm as if she was offering the explanation. We'd basically be pushing them into a corner and who knows how they'll react to that. They were getting bolder already, and now that we know the kind of political power they seem to be backed by, who knows what else they could be capable of. James nodded agreeingly, while Pippa seemed to take a step back and consider that. This was quite the precarious situation they had gotten themselves in, and that was true for both sides here. She doubted that Reprieve and Consuls would have a much better time trying to figure out how to handle this. A mechanical jittering and metal clanking foretold Curie wanting to take part in the conversation, as they positioned themselves more advantageous for talking to everyone simultaneously. The metal face shifted left to right as they tilted their body in evaluation, before their artificial voice finally sounded out. So, we can't wait out of fear that they might act coordinated, but we can't rush out of fear that they might act rashly, they summarised. It seems that there is no winning for us. James slightly chuckled. Both options have upsides too, Curie. There is a possible risk and possible reward. Right now, we have to decide which risk is more acceptable and which reward is more... Well, rewarding, he explained slowly, irritating a scale with his hands by lifting and lowering his palms next to each other. Curie lifted one of their short, forward arms to their unmoving face. Surely a decision that cannot be made rashly, they established, as they started to slightly sway in place, presumably trying to work out the pros and cons of both sides. Well, if we wait too long, the decision might be made for us, she interjected once again. Any moment, one of us could be contacted with one of them on the other end of the line. It was strange having to explain these things, or even just having to say them out loud. Shouldn't these be thoughts going through everyone's head automatically? Well, admittedly, Curie was an exception, but what about everyone else? However, James almost seemed to enjoy breaking down all these things, he surely knew intrinsically for everyone else. In fact, it almost seemed like he had gotten more ruminative than before, after listening to their obvious suggestions. As if to support that notion even further, James turned to the last person that hadn't said anything yet. What do you think, Moore? He asked the old woman openly, not a hint of negativity or doubt in his voice. Moore's nostrils flared as she took a deep, long breath in and out. I think... 
she says slowly but very firmly, that this has turned into something that we should not try to solve on our own. It was fine at first when things were uncertain, and it all seemed to happen on a small scale. But now, knowing just who is involved in this, and the kind of lengths they are willing to go to even just to prove a point, it has become clear that we are in over our heads. So if you ask me, the ones you should be contacting now are not them, but the human embassy. And trust all of this to people who are equipped to handle it a lot better than we are. So you can focus on your studies from now on, knowing everything will be handled by very capable humans. That was actually an option. Certainly when looking at it soberly, that would be the most reasonable route to take. The large woman dignifiedly looked back at them, as everyone was staring at her with restrained surprise. What she had said also seemed to get James thinking. His hand wandered to his chin once again as he looked at the ground pensively. I guess that would be the right thing to do, he reluctantly admitted after a while, and lifted his head again. Although I don't know if they will care. So far everything was directed specifically at me, after all. And I might be an ambassador out here, but to Earth, I'm just some guy. His voice carried a strange undertone. One that somehow made it seem like he wasn't being truthful, even though what he was saying was all a matter of fact. However, looking around, it became pretty clear that more suggestion was quickly becoming the accepted reality of what would be appropriate to do in their current situation. Even if the actual ambassadors of mankind wouldn't listen, it couldn't hurt to try after all. Although it did feel strange just handing off control to somebody else after all that had already happened. Strange that the subject of having to do less work suddenly sounded so unappealing. Where even is the human embassy? Pippa asked, looking at James quizzically. I have no idea, he immediately admitted. Shrugging with a lost look on his face. They didn't show you while dragging you around all day? Pippa responded confusedly, her ears wriggling in place as they turned towards James. James's gaze wandered to the corner of his eyes as he thought about that. Now that you mention it, that is strange, he replied earnestly. Well, given humanity's status, it's most likely a remote embassy and tucked away somewhere, Sheeta pointed out, lifting a single finger while explaining. We can just look it up, Moore commented calmly. For a change, we are talking about a very public building, not some well-kept secret. Somehow, things being easy just didn't feel right, but there was no argument with her logic. Right, James murmured, and immediately started rummaging through his pockets, pulling out his phone. Everyone just looked at him for a moment, as he let his fingers glide across the screen in a practice movement. It didn't take him long to find what he was looking for in the station's network. Oh no, that means we're walking. He finally groaned, as he looked up from the device, throwing his head backwards. That is pretty far away. She just smirked at him. I've seen you run for hours on end, don't tell me you of all people are tired. She teased him with a slight nudge against his arm. I would just like a break, he listlessly replied, taking a deep breath afterwards. Still, he diligently looked back down onto his phone, presumably to actually plan what route would be reasonable to take towards the embassy, or maybe more reasonably just to call the damn place if he had a phone in hand already. However, his eyes narrowed once he had studied the screen a bit more closely, and he very quietly murmured, What in the... That didn't sound good. What is it now? She'd asked, being the only one who was comfortable with getting really up close and personal with him in order to look at the small screen in his hands. It was only after she did that that she realised his phone was currently displaying everything in a language she was not able to read. James, who by now had to wrap an arm around her to accommodate for how close she had actually gone to him while trying to sit straight, began to loudly read for everyone to hear while translating the text in the process. Location currently close to maintenance for an undetermined amount of time. For more information or in case of problems, please contact the administration of the Great Community Station. We apologise for the inconvenience and will be available for you again soon. Shida almost laughed out loud at that. Well, isn't that convenient? She cracked up. It actually wasn't funny at all. In fact, given the situation, this was either quite serious or the biggest coincidence in the galaxy. However, the situation still made her laugh. Sounds more like the apology of a fast food place than that of an official government mission, Pippa ascertained dryly, and looked at the device James was holding distrustfully. James nodded pensively. That would be because government missions don't just close because of maintenance, so making it sound genuine is pretty much impossible, he assented. Then, with his voice turning a bit darker, he added, Now I just wonder how long it has been like this. Are you thinking they are already making their move, as you put it? Curie asked from the side, apparently having returned from their own world at the revelation that their pondering may already be useless. No, this was too quick. Even if they had this as a backup plan from the start, it would have taken them longer than this to pull it off. 
Shida could feel the mood of the conversation take a hard turn, as the realisation of what implications their newest finding carried with it slowly started to settle in. Maybe. But honestly, I feel more like we just found out why they won't show me the embassy on our little tour, James replied, supporting Shida's line of thinking unknowingly. But to what end? More anxiously reinserted herself into the conversation. You can just make contact with Earth yourself, can you not? And if you do that, will that not make everything seem even more suspicious? James shook his head, and slowly but surely, the strange calmness that she'd have felt when it came to this situation so far was beginning to show cracks. If the embassy is down, I doubt Earth is having any communication with the station right now, he said in a grave tone. Whatever they did, it's keeping the ambassadors from doing their work after all, so it has to be something really convincing. And if any of them could even make contact with the station, I'm sure they would insist on keeping up their work. It is a remote embassy, after all. It still can't hurt to try, Pippa perked up, although she didn't seem to be too sure about her own statement. Right, James mumbled. It was useless. Even if they would have been dealing with the most incompetent people in the galaxy, which they certainly weren't, there was no way anybody would not have thought of that. And by now, it seemed that a direct confrontation was all but unavoidable. As was to be expected, James's call yielded no results, so they were once again left at square one, and all they were able to do was try to find all options available to them, and pick the best one. Once again, they were on their own. And even though Shida hated to admit it, even in a situation like this, none of them had known just how right more had been before. They were in over their heads, and they had no idea just what they were up against, nor why. Just what do they want from you? Shida finally brought out, looking James right in the eyes. He shook his head again. No idea. I have some vague notions, but none of them would be worth going to such lengths over, he answered gloomily. Then his eyes wandered over to Curie, and he more quietly added, Although, I guess we technically already knew that they were willing to go all the way. The Sabotage So far, they have found no further link of James's observers and the incident other than James's first overhearing of Reprise call back on the ship. However, Standing stranded in the middle of the GCS and seemingly up against some of the most powerful people in the galaxy suddenly made the thought of them being involved in it a lot more palpable than it was before. Either way, I guess I will find out when I ask them, James stated matter-of-factly and pushed himself away from the table, standing up straight. You can't be serious, Pippa burst out, hopping in place while staring at James wide-eyed. Now that you know all that, you suddenly want to confront them? She'd have felt oddly thankful for Pippa's outburst, and she didn't want to be the one to say it. She knew that James was out of options, and criticising him for something that he surely didn't want to do wouldn't be making things any easier on him. But still, she would have loved to yell at him for how stupid that plan was. However, she didn't have a better one. Somewhere on the edge of her perception, she heard a knock. However, she was too focused on the problem at hand to pay it any mind. I don't really have a choice, James stated with clearly suppressed emotion in his voice, his hand clenching into fists as he spoke. It is either that, or trying to stall them out long enough that the human ambassadors start to get suspicious and come to check things out for themselves. I'm asked that probably won't take too long, seeing the stuff they are pulling off around here makes me not want to put them under any pressure, possibly forcing them to make any harsh decisions. Right now, it seems that whatever they want from me, they seem to have gotten it in their heads that they really need me for it. So, as long as they keep believing that, I'm most likely safe, so then you worry about me. Another knock came from somewhere. Nobody paid it any mind. Do you want us to come along with you? Moore asked. It was clear, asking that question alone already took a lot out of her. None of them had been entirely prepared for things to actually escalate, but it seemed to be taking an especially large toll on her. Maybe it was because she had been the voice of reason to suggest taking it up with the authorities in the first place. The authorities suddenly being of no help must have hit her quite hard. Still, she suggested something of which she'd have felt in her heart. She would not have had the guts to bring it up herself. However, she already knew James's answer. No, absolutely not, he said. Clearly, it also pained him turning down such a generous and, most likely, at least somewhat reassuring offer. Usually, the human face was almost grotesquely expressive, deforming every which way with every hint of emotion. However, right now, James's face was painfully placid, almost icy as he spoke. You've all been a great help so far, but now, it seems that it is better if I shoulder the rest of it alone. The less you know from here on out, the better. As long as I have even a speck of hope to get me on their side, I doubt they will even look at any of you funny. But I don't know how true that will hold if I don't keep you out of this from now on. A third knock rang out, completely unnoticed by anybody. 
It was a glum situation. There wasn't even any sign of actual danger yet. It was all pure speculation on their part, but that alone was a big enough risk to make other considerations simply fall to the wayside. Shida's ears and tail hung limply, as she couldn't bring out a single word. Somewhere deep down, she knew that, no matter how reasonable it was, had the roles been reversed, he would not let her go alone. But the roles weren't reversed. She was a risk taker. She had always been one. It had gotten her to where she was, even to get to this point where they stood now had involved a lot of risks on her part. But risking everything, for no gain but the possibility of comforting him, while he actively did not want anybody to accompany him, she couldn't bring herself to do it. What stung even more was that something in his eyes told her that he was thankful for that, something that, without any real reason, made her sure that getting to the point of him going alone would have been a lot more of a fight had she been human, or maybe she was just protecting her thoughts onto his gaze. There has to be something we can do. Pippa spoke the words that Sheeta could not bring herself to say. James just looked at her, forcing a soft smile onto his face. However, before he could get out whatever passing words he wanted to say, a frustrated sound ripped through the air. Tired of being ignored, a high, croaking voice suddenly loudly yelled out, Please, everybody, you're forgetting something. Immediately, all eyes shot around to the top of the table plate, where Chris sat, agitatedly reared up as much as their small frame allowed, and taking deep breaths as they spoke as loudly as they could. Nobody else said anything. Everyone was just staring at the tiny person, who some of them, including Sheeta, had never heard speak before. Chris huffed a few more loud breaths, as their cold eyes looked back at everyone watching them with intent gazes. They now had the stage all to themselves. Closing their mouth again, they lifted their arms, returning to their typical signed way of communication, and in plain, simple movements they signed. There are other embassies. Even after they were done, the stunned silence held for a bit longer. Then quickly and admittedly embarrassed looks were exchanged. Sometimes stress just tended to sweep someone up, I would not let go of them until it was forced to. Without uttering a word, James once more pulled out his phone, his finger gliding across the screen again. The Tomnastra side embassy isn't too far from the Rushgak Hive complex, he soberly established. So, humanity's closest allies were ready and available. Isn't the Hive technically an embassy as well? She'd have managed to get out, probably looking only half as flustered as she felt. Blood rushed from her ears so quickly that she heard a constant buzzing. I don't know if they can help us much, but how about I pay my peoples a visit and see what they can do? Pippa suggested, bouncing in place nervously. I wouldn't be too happy just sitting around doing nothing anyway. The Raffali should also be informed about this. Bork concurred with the notion, bobbing her giant head up and down. This whole situation needs to be brought to light, and with Councilman being involved in it, I'm sure they are going to listen. Sheeda risked a glance over at James. Slowly, a tiny bit of expressiveness seemed to be returning to his face, although he still seemed a bit reluctant to fully let it take over. Easy there, let's take this slowly, he stated. And the folds on his forehead showed that his brain had started to work. We we'll want to paint a target on your back now. James, with all due respect, you can't exactly tell me what to do, Pippa answered, although she too seemed to notice life returning to him, as her tone carried a hint of teasing challenge with it. James grinned widely and looked at everybody around him, one after the other. All right, here's what I think we should do, he finally said, clapping his hands loudly. You said it, Pippa, I can't tell you what to do. So you, Moore and Quiss, you three should split. Being around me just isn't a good idea anymore. What you do after that is up to you, but please do be careful. A general nodding in agreement was visible in the three, as they exchanged meaningful glances with each other. James now turned to Sheeda. Her ears fluttered in place as he addressed her. Sheeda, he said, more softly than before. From your reaction, I'm guessing that you don't expect the Mia to be much help in this, and I expect the Teravet to be the same. I know I can't tell you what to do either, but I would ask you to take Curie to the Hive for now, and look after them while I try to get this sorted out. Would you do that for me? Wordless, Sheeta just walked up to him and put her head on his shoulder. She couldn't go with him. Come back in one piece, she whispered, pressing her face into him as she felt his hands softly stroke through her hair. No promises, he answered, just loud enough that Sheeta could hear him. She remained in that position a while longer, feeling her warm breath spread through the fabric of his shirt and radiate back against her skin. And she could feel him holding her tight as he turned his head. Is that okay for you, Curie? He asked over her head. She didn't hear an answer, but Curie must have given some sort of indication that they agreed, because James soon made an acknowledging sound. 
Slowly, she'd appealed away from James, looking up at his softly smiling face. And finally, she bit her cheek from the inside, aggressively shaking her head and clenching her fists. It was time to get back on track already. Mustering all of her determination, she loudly exclaimed, All right, let's do this thing. Their mission was simple. Their task was clear. Whatever it was those people wanted, they weren't going to give it to them. And there was one more thing she needed to get out. One she had not dared to consider this entire time, but one she needed to accept right now if she wanted to see this through, even if it could make some of her oldest fears reality. James, one last thing, she said, looking him in the eyes. What's up? he asked candidly, while swinging his uniform jacket around, swiftly pulling it over his arms. If you meet the captain, she said, lifting her teeth to bare her teeth at the primate. Tell him we really need to talk. Meanwhile, somewhere far off, in a very different corner of the great community station, a towering figure had received a rather unpleasant call. And you are sure it was him? High Mage Shark, Apojinorana, Adoxia Tua, leader supreme of the great community station, asked the person currently displayed as a gigantic image on her video screen. We are certain that he was at least involved, Warrant Officer C. Hyferty answered, cautiously many of her branch-like arms never see fiddling with each other as she spoke. And how could this happen? The High Matriarch slowly asked, the two halves of her trunk swinging upwards to form an ironic heart shape of each other. We don't know yet, Hyferty admitted, of any eye contact with the Titan, even though she could only see a video projection of her. It may have something to do with so far unknown human capabilities. The Leader Supreme released a mighty breath out of her trunk, carrying the undertone of distaste with it, before she answered. Surely I don't have to tell you that this is unacceptable. Of course not, ma'am, Hyperty replied, averting her gaze from the screen entirely. Apogenorana moved her head left to right while looking at the screen, irregularly blinking with each of her eyes, one after another. This needs to be rectified, she finally stated, without paying the failure any more mind. Get the captain and his friend, the old fool. Now that they can speak freely, those two should be able to talk some sense into him. Hyferdi had turned back to the camera surprisingly. However, she did sound quite chipper as she replied, I'm sure of it, ma'am. Should she really be this optimistic about this? Maybe not. But on the other side, it wasn't like another failure would matter any more than this first one. One way or the other, they would reach their goal. That is all. She imperiously said, Success to you. Hyperty bowed to the camera, clearly answering, Unity in the community.